1970. The Soviet Republic, Ukraine. Situated near the Belarusian border in northern Ukraine, construction began on the power plant that would become the epicenter of the most disastrous mistake the world has ever seen. This film will take you into the heart of the disaster and what went wrong as we examine Chernobyl, hour by hour. On the banks of the Pripyat, a devil is sleeping, pretending the scoundrel is a dried up willow. On the banks of the Pripyat, the bank of, on the river, that once was deep blue, an atomic ca black candle is flickering for him. For him, villages in poverty and decline. On the riverbank, sands, his hooked claws sink in. In his ears, the wind whistles and whines. His obscenity scrawled on the windows and walls, cracked icons and a wrecked respirator. And now he feels that he's due a good dose. This is his empire, and he is the emperor. The reactor all black, his hell and his throne. In the sands he sleeps, curled up in flame. In his circle of ravens he dreams all alone. Of Ukraine, the whole of Ukraine. I never really wanted to go, to be honest. I mean, I feel, I feel like there's certain moral issues with sort of disaster tourism. Um, I, it's, it's something that makes me feel slightly uncomfortable about it. Um, I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, I know people who've been there and I don't sort of judge them for, for going there because, you know, it's interesting for sure. You know, I'm, I'm not saying I'll never go, but I, I don't know. There's something about the especially this sort of Western consumption of these images, of these kind of post-catastrophic, post-apocalyptic images of this abandoned city, which, you know, I feel that the, it's, this is kind of turning it into this sort of post-apocalyptic sublime, a sort of post-Soviet, you know, you know, we love to look at these sort of post-Soviet ruins. Um, and I feel like that sort of aestheticization of it is problematic in a lot of ways. Um, it's not, you know, I don't think this should be a form of entertainment. It shouldn't be something that we stand back and admire in awe. Um, it's something that we need to understand and talk about and engage with critically. In order to facilitate the construction and maintenance of the Chernobyl power plant, the Soviets founded Pripyat. Named after the river that flows nearby, Pripyat would evolve into a city by 1979 with a population of 50,000. By now, half of the four RBMK-1000 reactors had been built. <laughs> 
Chernobyl stood as a symbol of Soviet strength and autonomy. There was a certain kind of Soviet identity built on, again, this sort of myth of heroism and self-sacrifice, um, but also, you know, very much on the idea of people took a lot of pride in, in sort of progress, technology, things like the space race, you know, and space exploration were extremely important for us, sort of so the, the Soviet sense of the self, being some, you know, connected to that, connected to that society that's doing these things. Um, and the nuclear program is another example of that. You know, we're talking about the Cold War, we're talking about nuclear weapons, but also nuclear, you know, in terms of production of energy. And the ability of the state to develop these things is a source of national pride. And it's, you know, it's something that, you know, on the one hand, people retain a certain kind of skepticism to, towards, but I think, you know, I think there's also a sense of pride in these things as well. And when that seemed to kind of collapse suddenly, overnight, that also um, has a big impact on, you know, not only on the state's image that it's, that it's able to project, but also on people's sort of sense of um, Sovietness, Soviet identity as well. I mean, if you talk about Ukrainian national identity, then you can look at it from a different, a different point of view. You know, people who are more perhaps inclined to think of themselves as Ukrainian in opposition to, to being Soviet. And there are lots of people who do think of it in that way. For some people, being Ukrainian and Soviet was something you could combine. And for some people, it's the opposite. You know, it's, these are two things which oppose one another. Um, it was, again, it's a sort of another example of the victimization of Ukraine from Moscow. You know, a process that goes back hundreds of years. This was another example of that. So in that sense, you know, in, in many ways, it sort of helps to um, bolster, reinforce that kind of sense of victimhood that's at the heart of the, the national identity as well. Completion of Reactor 4 in 1983 pushed electricity production to 4,000 megawatts, enough to produce 10% of Ukraine's energy. Most of the people living around the boat would, would be Ukrainians, but this is the Soviet Union. It's a, very, it's a mixed society. There are people from different parts of the Soviet Union. There are Russians, people from elsewhere. This was a period when the Soviet Union was coming out of the period of stagnation. There was a sort of sense of a lack of change and a lack of progress, maybe in the, sort of the period following Khrushchev up until Gorbachev. There's this kind of feeling uh, that politically, the liberalization that happened after Stalin was being rolled back. Then that comes to an end in the sort of mid-1980s when Gorbachev comes to power, Gorbachev being this sort of young, uh, reform-minded leader. So this, it's a very important moment, this actually. So the middle of the 1980s is when the policies of Glasnost perestroika, um, sort of reform and openness within the Soviet system uh, start being pursued. And Chernobyl happens right at this moment. So it's this moment where there's a feeling that sort of not, you know, things have become stagnant. This is why it's called the sort of stagnation. Not much has been changing, um, you know, socially, economically, politically. There had been a sort of a lack of change. And then you get this moment of change. Things really start to, to change quite quickly. And on the top of that, you get this massive catastrophe. April 25th, 1986, 1 a.m. In preparation for a safety test at reactor number four, Operators of the Chernobyl power plant began to reduce power, testing whether the plant can continue to produce enough energy in the event of a power failure. Two p.m. Thirteen hours later, operators disabled the reactor's emergency core cooling system, in turn, limiting its interference with the safety test. 11.10 p.m. By this late hour, the more inexperienced operators of the reactor were on shift. 
receiving word to continue with the planned safety test and shutdown. April 26, 1986, 12.28 a.m. Power drains from the reactor, continuing to a dangerous level, forcing the removal of control rods, violating the safety guidelines. Panic sets in. 1 a.m. Half an hour later, power settles, prompting supervisors to persevere with the test, shutting down the safety features in preparation. 1.23 a.m. The test is initiated unexpectedly triggering a sudden surge of power. Operators urgently press the emergency shutdown button, abruptly jamming the control rods in the process. Unable to control the chain reaction, reactor four is sent into meltdown. Design flaws in the emergency shutdown system set the inevitable in motion. April 26, 1986, 1.24 a.m. A fireball brightens the night sky, ripping the 1,000-ton roof off in the process. Radiation spewed from the cracks in the collapsing walls as fires begin taking hold around the reactor. There were obviously local authorities, so the Ukrainian Communist Party, which would be sort of directly responsible for what's happening in a situation like this on its territory. What you saw was a lack of response. The local authorities, the Republican authorities, didn't know how to deal with this. Part of that is down to the uh, centralized, hierarchical nature of the Soviet Union, was that you know, nothing could really be done without Moscow's approval. So if something like that happens at a local level, it's very difficult for people to take the initiative. So there's a lack of reaction. There's fear of mishandling the situation at the local level. There's, you know, sort of sending it to Moscow, putting the responsibility on Moscow and waiting for Moscow to tell us what to do. That, you know, in part explains some of the delays an unwillingness to take responsibility for this because taking responsibility, showing initiative, improvising, um, puts you at risk you know, of doing the wrong thing, of doing something that the center didn't want you to do. April 26, 1986, 1.28 a.m. The cleanup begins. Not four minutes later, the first responding firefighters arrive, unprotected and unaware of the radiation seeping into the atmosphere. The reaction to the disaster was flawed in many ways. 
the cleanup operation itself, the, the Soviet Union did what they tended to do, which was throw people at it. The Soviet Union, you know, you know, going back to the Second World War, there's this sort of uh, culture of thinking of its citizens as being sort of expendable. And this was certainly the attitude during the war. And, you know, even though this is decades later, even though this is a time of reform, it seems that that attitude still persisted. So the attitude was to send people in without the right equipment, not necessarily with the right training, to deal with something that nobody had ever dealt with, that was extremely dangerous, that, that, and which would you know, for sure have a terrible effect on the health of those people that had been involved in it. These, you know, the liquidators sent in doing it by hand without the right kind of equipment, ad hoc, improvising, you know, it was, nobody was prepared for this. The Soviet Union did have a sort of culture of uh, heroism, the cult of the hero. And again, you, know, you always kind of find yourself coming back to the Second World War, which for the Soviet Union after the war, it's very, you know, its foundation myth was a victory over fascism in the Second World War. And that was based on the heroism and self-sacrifice of the Soviet people. The heroism of the Soviet person, the willingness to sacrifice yourself for your society, that was very deeply ingrained in the so official discourse, official rhetoric, but I think to, to a large degree internalized by people as well. So I think that sort of explains the willingness of people to put themselves on the line, on, you know, from, from one hand. On the other hand, it's also the state viewing those people the way they viewed the soldiers during the Second World War, that they can be thrown into a dangerous situation without much regard for their protection. The liquidators of the accident are widely credited with limiting the immediate and long-term damage, putting their lives on the line for the unwitting community. April 26, 1986, 2.15 a.m. After an emergency meeting, local Soviet officials ordered the blocking of roads in and out of Pripyat. Policemen line the streets, unprotected and unaware of the radiation. 6.35 a.m. Dawn broke, bringing the scope of the devastation into view. Plumes of smoke rose from the now extinguished fires surrounding the power plant. Fires at the epicenter of the reactor core would continue to burn for several days. By the end, population in the near vicinity, I think, have to be evacuated because the, there the radiation level could be very high. And I should imagine that within a radius of about 30 or 40 miles, people would have to be evacuated for, for, for quite a long time. It takes afterwards a very long time to de decontaminate. You know that they, one test in the bikini, which happened many years ago, about 30 years ago, it took years before the, 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 the people could go back there. And even now, they're not allowed to eat the food uh, grown there. So it may take years and years before it goes back to normal. April 27th, 1986, 10 a.m. Attempts to hamper the radioactive emissions began. Dumping sand, clay, lead, boron, and dolomite through the roof of the destroyed reactor. Nicknamed the elephant's foot for its wrinkly appearance, the solid radioactive mass of melted nuclear fuel, metal, and concrete still lies at the center of Reactor 4. At the time of its discovery, a lethal dose of radiation would be delivered within 30 seconds, causing death within days. Earning the label, most toxic mass on Earth. April 27th, 1986, 2 p.m. Until now, the secretive state gave no word of warning to the residents of nearby Pripyat. 
36 hours after the explosion, Pripyat and the neighboring towns were finally evacuated. Informed that it would only be a temporary evacuation. Without delay, an exclusion zone was set up, barring any re-entry. They were told initially that they were only going for a short period of time. So I think, you know, in the initial evacuation, people didn't know that they wouldn't be coming back. They left a lot of their belongings behind, you know, which is why when you go there, you can, you know, you still, you, you come to a sort of city where it seems like people have just left and, and left everything, left their possessions lying around, you know, which, you know, makes it very sort of eerie place. People did not understand that they were leaving for good when they were evacuated. They were evacuated to different places, but, you know, for example, there's the, sort of the newest Ukrainian city, Slavutij, which is not, not too far away in northern Ukraine, was built, basically set up in the, in the end of the 80s uh, to house people who'd been moved. There were some people who probably evaded the evacuations, and then there were people who returned afterwards, especially sort of to the rural areas, to the villages, older people who lived there, you know, for, you know, maybe for generations, um, who couldn't find, you know, sort of couldn't find a place for themselves, uh, you know, whether it's in, in a big city or whatever. You know, people are very much tied to the land and tied to the region. Some of those people did go back. Your sort of whole world is, is shattered, essentially, you know, and especially, especially a lot of people, they, they, not only they're losing their homes, they're losing their jobs. People who've worked in the nuclear industry and suddenly, you know, their workplace, their home, their hometown, it's all gone. So obviously this is an extremely traumatic experience. The radiation itself, you know, the, sort of the fallout affects, uh, arguably affects Belarus worse than it affects Ukraine because of the weather conditions at the time, everything goes towards Belarus. And some, I think almost a quarter of Belarus's territory is affected by the radiation. In that sense, Ukraine was sort of fortunate that it, it sort of went in that direction. Forsmark, Sweden, April 28th, 1986. Air monitors at the Forsmark power plant register high levels of radiation. The early detection played an important role in forcing the Soviet Union to publicly acknowledge the disaster, having concealed the news for two days. The fact that this has been noticed abroad is another thing that uh, means that the, the Soviet state has to admit that something's gone wrong. Because, you know, it's, it's, it's already, people can see it. People, you know, people in different Euro other European countries can see that something has happened. They're measuring the radiation. So it becomes impossible to cover it up. So, I mean, that, that, in that sense, that's important. You know, this looks very bad for the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union is, is, is worried about its, its image abroad. It's projecting an image of itself to its own citizens and it's projecting an image outwards. And something like this, you know, it really seriously damages the, the, the state's image. So, you know, there, there are lots of things that make it very difficult to deal with. And there's this, just this kind of sense that, you know, there was uncertainty what to do. In an attempt to deceive the global community, Soviet officials falsely state the accident is under control. Somebody at the top has to decide what's going to happen. But what I don't think will happen is that they will suddenly, as it were, come clean and become very open, allow international inspection and so on. What is much more likely to happen is that in the course of time, new information will be released in dribs and drabs, but this will come out as they see fit. They're not going to suddenly open the doors to people to go in to see what's happened, and I don't think that they're going to accept international aid either. April 29th, 1986. For the first time, spy satellite photographs reveal the extent of the damage done to the Chernobyl power plant. May 1st, 1986. Kiev 
55 miles south of Chernobyl. Red banners and flags adorn the streets in preparation for the May Day Parade. As the plume of radiation continues to spread throughout Europe, Soviet officials refuse to cancel the festivities, knowing the full danger posed by the radioactive cloud. Unsuspecting locals, full of optimism, celebrated the International Workers' Day, unaware of the impending crisis to their lives. We don't think that they have provided as full and prompt information as they should have. Our own pictures give us information that suggests the casualty rates are higher than those that have been announced by the Soviet Union so far, by a good measure. Soviet people were not stupid. They, they knew that the, the government doesn't tell the truth about lots of things. You know, they knew that a lot of their society, a lot of the, the, the rhetoric coming from above is about creating, you know, illusions, certain images of society. But, you know, on an everyday level, people can, people sort of learn to live within that system. But then you get this, something like this, which is such a threat to, a direct threat to people's lives, which is something really quite terrifying. You know, people realize that they've been sent out on a May Day parade just a few days after this, when, you know, wh what's the threat to their lives by coming out into the street like this? You know, and thousands of people have been sent out into the street to this parade just after the disaster, which has happened, you know, 80 miles away, while the high-ranking party officials are evacuating their own families. That undermines trust quite seriously. There's also the question of why this is happening in Ukraine. So there's a center periphery relationship, which is important here. One of the reasons why the Soviet Union collapses is because the various, various sort of political national movements in the republics start to pull away from the center. So in Ukraine, there's a strong movement for national autonomy, national independence, which is growing in the second half of the 1980s. Um, the same in other republics, you know, especially the Baltic states, for example. Why does this happen on the periphery? in Ukraine? Why, is it, why was this power station not built 80 miles from Moscow? Why is, this, why is this disaster not happening there? There's a sense that this has kind of been done to the periphery because it's the sort of latest in a line of almost sort of acts of violence. Even Some people even see it as this kind of act of you know, colonial violence that's coming from the, the center of the empire. And there's a sort of attitude of negligence towards the periphery. You know, this is these are people who don't count, who are not so important. And things like this can happen there, it doesn't matter too much. And it's, it's sort of the latest in a long line. You, know, you have Stalin, you have the, the famines of the 1930s, you have Stalinist repressions, the repression of the nationalist movement during the Second World War, and now you have this. You know, the latest example of Moscow's attitude towards us. Chernobyl, May 4th, 1986. Attempts to further cool Reactor 4 had started. Liquid nitrogen was pumped underneath the dead reactor. Since the explosion, over 600,000 liquidators were brought in to clean up the catastrophic accident. Homes were bulldozed. Whole villages were torn down. Vast amounts of radioactive soil were buried. And contaminated pets and livestock were shot. <laughs> 
The wildlife there has obviously been infected, affected in negative ways by radiation, you know, crops and food and things that people were growing, um, you know, couldn't be consumed and so on. But at the same time, the removal of, sort of human population for the last you know, sort of 30 years has meant that, you know, in some ways it's, it's, it's become a good environment for wildlife. Natural life has returned to these areas. Um, and it's sort of flourishing in many ways, sort of paradoxically as well. May 6th, 1986. Ten days on from the disastrous safety test, the first drop in radioactive emissions is recorded. Fires at the core of the reactor had begun to burn out. In nearby Kiev, officials at long last ordered schools to close and advise residents to stay inside. May 9th, 1986. Concrete is poured under the reactor. Plans to encase the damaged reactor within a metal structure, also known as the sarcophagus, begins. laying the darkest day in Ukraine's history to rest. May 14th, 1986. Unseen since before the explosion at the plant, Soviet leader Gorbachev addresses his nation on state television, stating, the worst is behind us. What's going on over there? We're rather limited in our in our information. The Soviet, Soviets have not told you very much, have they, sir? Uh, not very much. They're usually a little close mouthed about things. Would you rather? Exception. Would you rather hear more from Mr. Gorbachev? Yes, I think it would be helpful. You know, it's hard to say exactly why. It took so long for the news of the catastrophe to be officially announced. You know, so there's a three-week gap. You know, it's partly because the authorities are worried about panic. They're worried about the effect on the local population. They're worried about, you know, potentially causing unrest, causing people to flee. They're also worried about the impact, you know, how this looks abroad. There was a sense that, you know, why have we waited so long? You know, what, what have we been doing for three weeks? You know, something like this that's so dangerous and so terrifying has happened and we're not being told about it for three weeks. That really undermines trust in Gorbachev. There were many people in Ukraine who thought that, you know, who were in favor of Gorbachev. There were people who thought that his reforms were a good thing. People who thought that, you know, they could be used to uh, win more sort of political autonomy for Ukraine within the Soviet system. And then you get this, which seems to undermine that quite considerably, yeah. It was one of those things that kind of marked the break with the Soviet era. You know, even though the Soviet Union survives for another five years, it was, there was something that really broke the spell in some kind of ways, you know, of, of, of kind of Soviet ideology and Soviet discourse. Even those who were believers at the time, I think, became disillusioned. And in that sense, you know, if, if you think of it as something that led to Ukrainian independence, to the collapse of the Soviet Union, to, you know, the establishment of democracy in that part of the world, then you know, I guess there is a, a positive side to it, even though it, it seems quite sort of paradoxical, counterintuitive. As seen on ABC News, Gorbachev calls for world leaders to meet and formulate a ban on nuclear testing. A sharp shift in the Soviet Union strategy. The Soviet government, weighing all the circumstances connected with the security of its own people and the whole of mankind, has taken the decision to extend its unilateral moratorium on nuclear testing until the 6th of August this year. He coupled the step with a renewed offer to meet President Reagan. 
My proposal to President Reagan is that we meet without delay in the capital of any European country which would be willing to host such a meeting, or for example in Hiroshima, and work for agreement on banning nuclear tests. 20 years later, Gorbachev would affirm that the Chernobyl disaster, even more than the launch of Perestroika, was the real catalyst for the collapse of the Soviet Union. The Chernobyl disaster is often cited as one of the reasons why the Soviet Union collapsed. I mean, there are lots of reasons why the Soviet Union collapsed, and, you know, historians are still debating it. But certainly, Chernobyl really undermined the, the Soviet system in, in many ways. First of all, there was a question of truth. There was supposedly this new culture of openness where the authorities would be more open, tell the truth about what's happening in the society. And then this happens and the immediate, the immediate reaction is a cover-up. So on the one hand, you have you know, reform processes whereby people are beginning to expect more openness from above, from the government. And on the other hand, you have this demonstration that those things are not happening yet. You have this, you know, uh, this quite striking counterexample, you know, an example of yet again the government is lying to us, the government is covering things up. That really undermines uh, faith in, in the system itself. In the immediate aftermath of the explosion, reportedly two workers died and 18 were seriously ill. This would continue to exponentially grow in the months following as men, women and children continued to eat contaminated food and water, causing a 5% increase in adults and 90% increase in children in regional cases of cancer. The question of how many deaths do we connect directly to Chernobyl is, is extremely difficult. I mean, obviously we can count the casualties involved in the initial disaster and in the initial cleanup operation. We know that you know, people went there and got extremely high doses of radiation and they died fairly quickly. Those numbers are relatively small. It's still enough to, to be a horrendous accident, but it's, you know, it, you're not talking about thousands and hundreds of thousands. You know, the thing about this, this, this is, a, this is a, a nuclear disaster. We're talking about radiation. We're talking about something that's invisible. The direct effects of it are extremely hard to measure. So the estimates as to, you know, how many people are dying because of this, how many illnesses, um, you know, how many unborn, how many children are not born because of this, very, very difficult, you know, and the, and the estimates are very widely. The people who were involved in the initial disaster, the people who were involved in those sort of, uh, and when the cleanup, I don't think there was much that could be done for them, really. The healthcare that was available, I think, was not able to, in most cases, was not able to save their lives or, or sort of care for them in any sort of very effective way. People who are affected by the disaster then get certain state benefits after that. You know, this was something that cost the state a lot of money and, and continues to cost the state a lot of money. The children of Chernobyl survivors are still eligible for, for certain kinds of benefits. There are quite, you know, relatively large numbers of people who are receiving various kinds of state benefits because they're connected in some way to the Chernobyl catastrophe. You know, the standard of health care in the late Soviet Union and post-Soviet Ukraine is not particularly high. There are a lot of problems in that area. So, I mean, and this is, this is why there's been this kind of need to send people um, abroad as well. Weather patterns spread the fallout as far as Britain and Turkey, increasing the likelihood of causing detrimental long-term health problems, such as cancer, to unsuspecting families throughout Europe. Something of the order of 40 or 45 deaths might be expected in all subsequent years as a result of this accident. Later, what's, I think what's interesting in terms of you know, the relationship between the Soviet Union and other European countries is that 
Other countries get involved in helping deal with the, the aftermath of the disaster. So whether that's providing help, you know, aid, expertise to deal with the cleanup, um, which is, of course, for the Soviet Union, kind of an embarrassment. Um, and that gets out, you know, in society and people see that, okay, we have to rely on the West to help us in this situation. That, again, that's sort of undermining the state. And you get these sort of interesting links where, you know, um, so sort of the children of uh, Chernobyl survivors are taken to Western Europe for you know, holidays and so on. And that's quite a big scheme, you know, and various, you get various kinds of interesting civil society partnerships happening between the Soviet Union and then the, the, the former Soviet Union as well and Western European countries. Um, and I think that's, you know, those links are actually quite important in Western European countries beginning to understand something about what, what was happening in the Soviet Union and come into contact with people from there and vice versa as well. If one positive thing came out of it is that, you know, there, there's certain kind of exchange and communication happening. Months later, scientific consensus not only blamed the accident on human error, but also on design flaws within the Soviet reactor. Flaws that were known to the Kremlin. You know, in Ukraine, there is a profound sense that, particularly the 20th century, but you know, the entire of Ukrainian history is a history of trauma and of victimization. And you know, there's a lot of justification for that. If you look back at Ukrainian history, it's been it's a particularly difficult history. And Chernobyl is just is seen as another one of those uh, sort of disasters that happened in our history. And you know, and it sort of um, shapes the country and shapes the society and shapes identity uh, in, in many ways. But um, I think you know, I think still a lot has to be done to to come to terms with it because it's it's very recent. You know, this is this is something that only happens. Um, you know, very recently, and I think it, the, the sort of generational process is always important with these kind of big cultural traumas. It always takes a couple of generations before these things are really processed properly, and the sort of significance is really understood. The Chernobyl disaster is something which is part of everyday culture in Ukraine. You know, it's something that, um, you know, it's, it's present in literature and film and art. It's also pre present in the way that people talk on an everyday level. You know, so Chernobyl is, you know, it's, it's part of the folk memory as well. All kinds of illnesses, all kinds of uh, things can be attributed to Chernobyl. You know, not necessarily on the basis of facts, but you know, this, this thing happened and there's this kind of sense that we're all suffering from it still and it's having these kind of invisible, unquantifiable effects. People's imagination can, can run away with that. On the other hand, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's even the source of a kind of, sort of black humour in Ukraine as well, you know, it's sort of, people often joke about Chernobyl, you know, if you, you get a sort of <laughs> particularly large or unusual looking vegetable or something that people might connect it to Chernobyl. You know, and some people also have a sort of sense of humor about it. By 1996, the hastily built sarcophagus had started to deteriorate. Unable to repair the growing cracks in the walls, Officials began planning a feat of architectural excellence. Construction on a movable new structure began in 1998 and by 2019 cost 1.5 billion euros. On its completion, the new shelter became the largest movable structure in the world. Its primary goal? To contain the radiation for the next 100 years. <laughs> 
parts of the zone are, are not particularly dangerous. You know, I think that now looking back at it, sort of historians, scientists say that some of the evacuations were not necessary, you know, necessarily, that there are parts of the, the restricted zone which are not necessarily more damaging for your health to live there than to live in the centre of a big city, you know, in terms of the effects of pollution on your health. Whether people will ever move back to Pripyat or, you know, the immediate area, you know, I don't know, I, th I, think, it's a, I think it's a very long-term thing as far as I understand it. In terms of culture, you know, it had a very interesting effect on Ukrainian culture. Um, there's, there's the idea that Chernobyl was the moment where Ukrainian culture becomes postmodern, because this is the, this is the moment when people realize that modernity, in the Soviet sense, is over. The sort of Soviet idea of progress, of technology, the sort of reliance on heavy industry. All of, all of these things that were the sort of foundations of Soviet modernity were undermined. And there's the sense that we're in this kind of postmodern era. Culture sort of responds to that as well. So if you look at the sort of the way that uh, Ukrainian literature, for example, responds to it, you get this move away from maybe the sort of more epic forms from fiction, from novels, and you get this sort of very interesting experiments with non-fiction, documentary fiction, sort of fragmented narratives. This idea that sort of the languages of modernism or of, you know, or, or sort of Soviet official culture were no longer sufficient. New sort of modes of expression to talk about this kind of post-apocalyptic, post-modern reality. You know, in many ways, quite similar to what's happening in the West. It's not dissimilar, but it's got this kind of specific post-Soviet uh, twist to it. So, I mean, in that sense, it's, it's quite productive, even, you know, in a cultural sense. Looking at sort of the post-Soviet countries, renewable energies are not something that people are talking an awful lot about. It's the, the, that, those kind of ideas are not well developed there. The, you know, it's, it's actually interesting to look at the, the attitudes towards nuclear energy in the post-Soviet world. Surprisingly, there, there hasn't been a sort of massive turn against it. You know, maybe in the immediate post-Chernobyl period. I think there was probably a, a bigger turn against it in Western Europe. You know, you see the way that Germany sort of reversed its, uh, a lot of its sort of nuclear programs and, and things like that. But in, in Ukraine, it's still seen as, you know, nuclear power is still seen as desirable because it means that you're not dependent on Russia for energy. You know, you're not dependent on importing gas and oil from Russia. Nuclear power allows you to produce energy, you know, wherever you are, where you build the station. And if you build it in your country, you have a, you have an, you know, it, it sort of helps your country be independent. So, you know, there's still the sense that it's, it's not the fault of nuclear energy, it's the fault of what Moscow did with nuclear energy. The accident at Chernobyl released at least 100 times more radiation than the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, providing a grave reminder of the true power of nuclear energy. A terrible kaleidoscope. A terrible kaleidoscope. In this moment, somewhere, someone dies in this moment, this very moment. Each and every minute, a ship is wrecked. The Galapagos burn, and above the Dnipro sets the bitter wormwood star. Explosion, volcano, ruin, destruction. One aims, another falls. Don't shoot, third implores. Scheherazade's tales run dry. Lorelei sings by the Rhine no more. A child plays, a comet flies. Faces bloom, not erased by dread. Blessed is each moment we are alive in these world wild fields of death.